Welcome back to part B of this two-part chat with former kookaburra Tristan White. If you're just tuning in and you missed part A, I recommend you go back and check it out. What you're about to hear is going to make a lot more sense. For the rest of you, good to be with you again. Let's rip in. Moving on to 2016, because I guess um, from my perspective as a teammate in that year, it it looked like probably one of your best years, but also um, one of your hardest years, especially considering performances. Um, One tournament in particular, Champions Trophy 2016, it was an unbelievably good tournament for you, playing in the midfield, scoring goals, but just kind of managing the game, controlling the game, and it looked like you were having a lot of fun. And that led to... um, your selection a few weeks later in the in the Rio um, in the Rio Olympic team, which is which is brilliant. Um, do you want to just talk about that? How that year felt for you? Yeah, that year was was definitely almost a culmination of everything that I'd done um, during the previous kind of four or five years. So there was a lot of kind of trials, tribulations, ups and downs during those during those years. Um, but I, I think it got to kind of end of 2015 um, and I made the decision that I was going to move back to Perth and really have a dip at the Olympics. Um, and that was the first time, I think, in my kind of hockey career where I, I went, this is all that I'm focusing on. There's nothing else. I'm, I'm going there. I'm going to play the Olympics. Um, and that was probably yeah, a combination of the experiences that I've had. And, and during that year, I just felt, super confident because I had this one goal. Um, I was pretty relaxed about the goal. I knew that I was playing well um, and the team kind of respected me and and that I was a valued member of the team. That was always a big thing for me. Um, And during that year, it went super quick. um, But I I just remember everything that we did, I I really, really got engaged with, um, probably for the first time ever um, and probably for the only, only year ever, realistically, when I was in the Aussie team. But every se- every session, every kind of aspect of it, and whether it's not just training, it's recovery, and all those type of things, I really, I really tried my, my best, um, and it showed on the field. So there's probably a lesson to to younger guys, or a lesson to my younger self, if I could tell him then, um, to to try and do that as much as you can. But to be honest, it wouldn't have ever work for me. I probably would have got burnt out. But during 2016, um, yeah, it just clicked. For, for some reason, um, I felt like that was my purpose to, to kind of play that. I'd always said I wanted to play the Olympics and that was my goal as a hockey player. Um, I wanted to win the Olympics and that was what we were kind of working on that year. And yeah, I, I, to be honest, I, I can't really put too many words as to mm. how it felt. Um, it just felt good and I was enjoying it. Yeah, but you, I mean, like we think about now, um, like I often think about like players in form, you know, um, and definitely when I think of like it in form, just six months of just chopping is that 2016 yep. for you um, kind of broke yep. away into being like a very important midfielder for a very good Australian team. Like when you're at that yep. 2016 champions trophy, if we talk about preparation, um, mm. like, how did you know you were going to keep playing well or you didn't know or did it, did it feel different? Did you have different nerves? Were you just supremely confident going into every game? Um, how was the mental prep? I, I, I probably, I probably didn't have those questions of myself and that was, sure. that was probably the big difference. Um, and it's something that I don't, I don't have those questions of myself now. Um, there was obviously less pressure on, on what I do now. Um, but the leading up to the, the 2016 Olympics, you know, from 2012 onwards, um, I always had this kind of question as to, am I ready? Um, have I done enough? Can I really go out there and mix it? Am I the best in the, you know, do I, do I deserve my spot in this team or is there someone else? Um, but 2016, I didn't have those thoughts, you know. Um, I was supremely confident. Um, and going into that tournament, um, uh, the Champions Trophy in London, I just remember being super relaxed. Um, I used to... I used to try and work myself up for games and, you know, be this really intense guy and or be sitting at the back of the bus listening to some heavy music um, <laughs> while everyone Red else Bull. was relaxing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just really going hard. And I remember I, I used to do that just because I thought I had to get myself up and get myself ready. But that tournament and that whole year, I, I didn't do that. I kind of embraced the team team culture a bit more. And I remember playing um, 
playing cards on the way to the to the games. What about top trumps? Like every single game, every training. No, I'm not a top trumps fan. It was 500. <laughs> um, but I just remember being super super relaxed, so much so that it kind of got out to onto the field and it just felt second nature that I, I wasn't even I wasn't worried about how I was going to perform. I wasn't worried about how the team was going to perform. Um, so that was probably the biggest thing for me is just, is just being relaxed. Um, and since then, that's kind of how I play hockey. That's probably how a lot of young guys see me as now. Mm. Um, and it was, a, it was probably a turning point, yeah. Mm. we got to talk about um, Rio as well because one of the most kind of heartbreaking things that I've definitely been involved with and other people as well was after being selected in that, in that Rio 16 in an intra-squad game a couple of weeks before departure, I think. Um, yep. Sustained an injury. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so I think it was two or three weeks before. It was, it was really close. Um, yeah, obviously had all the, the hype around being selected um, uh, and that was kind of starting to settle in that we're actually going. Um, and again, just training really hard, training really well. Um, the injury... It was a bit of a funny one. Um, we were just playing this inner squad game, um, and I, I thought of myself as a bit of a goal sneak during that <laughs> during that period. Just, you know, I got a couple of goals and thought, well, hey, um, stuff being a stuff being a defender, I'm going to play midfield and score goals. And yeah, it was just an innocuous thing in in the game. Um, I went to kind of get a get a deflection on the post, um, and instead of the ball coming nice and flat, it actually came pretty high, like up up around the head. So I just dropped down to my knee. Um, and just landed on my knee, um, pretty innocuous, and yeah, didn't think too much of it. Kind of felt a bit of pain, went off, got it checked out, and I went, oh, you know, it feels relatively stable um, because what happens at that time is, you know, all of your muscles kind of contract and protect the knee. Um, so didn't think too much of it, but tried to run, went back on the field and tried to run, and it just kind of gave out on me. So that was pretty pretty tough. Like I. I knew it at the time um, and I knew the medical staff um, were trying to give me a bit of hope and saying that there was things that we could do and that, you know, we're going to get these scans and going to see if there's actually something there. But I I knew. Um, I remember just being like in tears on the sideline, trying to hold it in. And it's it's hard when your teammates know as well. So they, they can come over and see kind of how bad it is and how much it means. So that was pretty, that was pretty tough. Um, Probably, yeah, that those those couple of weeks were just probably the hardest of my life, to be honest. Um, and I'm pretty lucky, realistically, that that's probably the hardest part of my part of my life. Um, well, that's probably one of the worst things that's ever happened to me because in the in the big scheme of things, um, that's that's not too bad. But yeah, I mean, to go from this high elation of reaching my my goal and looking back when I was five years old and I had a a picture of myself on the wall um, saying I've been in the Olympics to to missing out, being so close. Um, yeah, that was obviously that was gut wrenching. Um, just don't really know how else to put it. Mm. So you knew straight, and it was a it was an MCL rupture, was it? P- P- PCL, PCL, PCL. So yeah, so basically the one that stops your knee from hyperextending. Um, yeah, I, I knew, I knew it was, I knew it was bad enough that I that I couldn't play in two, <laughs> two weeks. Yeah. Um, just because I mean I remember getting out of bed the next morning um, and I couldn't really lift it without it sagging. So basically, what your you know, your knee kind of sags backwards when you lift it up, um, and and it did that. And, you know, again went went and got all the scans, went and checked all the doctors and everything like that, and they were looking at ways we could maybe play, but I kind of knew it was all in vain. Um, probably just trying to keep me in keep me in good spirits for mm. for a little bit. Um, and it wasn't long after that, you know, kind of got the, got the verdict that it was, it was no good, but also in, in, in my mind when the, the, the physical, the physios and the doctors were saying, oh, maybe we can, maybe we can brace it. You know, like you see these NFL players mm. with these big braces and they seem to be fine. Um, maybe we can do that. Um, part of me was just, was just thinking, well, there's no point in me going if I'm 60 or 70%, you know, mm. the, the great, the great part about the kookaburras is, there's someone else that's a hundred percent and he's going to be so much better than me at, at, at 60 or 70 percent. So why, why would I even push it? Um, so I was pretty, I was pretty um, realistic about it, to be yeah. honest. Like there was never a point where I went, Oh, I'm going to try and scrape through it just so I can get there and tick this box. Um, yeah. I would have I would have probably hated myself if I, 
had a went and did it worse or, you know, got into a situation where I left the team kind of high and dry by getting hurt when we were there. So, you know, pretty, um, yeah, pretty devastated, obviously, that happened, but happy that um, that someone else um, was able to go and um, take my place. Yeah, yeah. And how long does the... Um how long does the dust take to settle on that? I know you went to Bali during the Olympics, I think, <laughs> or maybe straight away. Yeah. I don't know. How long did it take to <laughs> straight away? Oh, <laughs> uh, it didn't settle for a long time. Um, yeah, I remember. I remember. I, I think it was a week out from from the Olympics, and I was kind of packing up my stuff to go to go move back home. Um, and I went, oh look, I'll just make a stop over in Bali. Um, just <laughs> went went with went with my, my partner Lauren um, and probably well I definitely I definitely know that I wasn't kind of in the right state of mind because I booked it after a few um, after a few drinks uh, one night and uh, it was all fine I had a, had a great time it was really good to unwind over there and um, really relax and I thought when I was there I wasn't going to watch watch much of the hockey um, but I found myself chasing to try and you know find this find um ways to stream the games and I watched mm. every game and I was really kind of, I was really, really egging the guys on and really proud to kind of watch. I thought at the time I wouldn't want to, but um, yeah, we went to come home from Bali. Um, we got a midnight flight or something, rocked up to the airport and I'd booked a flight two months later <laughs> when I was, because, I, because I booked it when I, I'd had a few too many beers. So um, yeah, that was, that was pretty, that was probably more disappointing to be honest. I was sitting there had to buy another, <laughs> A thousand bucks worth of flights. Um, just thought you're an idiot, but um, but yeah, I got over. I think I got over that like specific part of it pretty quickly. Um, I came home uh, and I, I fell into the job that I'm in now. So as a silver lining, I wouldn't have never had this career that I'm in now. I, I kind of rocked up and just fell into it basically. Um, so that kind of eased ease the blow a bit. Um, but in terms of then getting back into wanting to play serious hockey again, that was a long, that was a long time. Um, mm. To be honest, I was always saying I'm never going to go back and play. And probably the only reason I did was because I wanted to prove to myself that I could still do it. Um, but realistically, I didn't see myself going to um, another full four years for an Olympic, Olympic run. That's... Um... That in itself is quite incredible. I want to talk about that a little bit because obviously the heartbreak of not like being so close but so far to that 2016. And to be honest, like uh, COVID aside, the fact is is that um, you're only 30 now, which is it might feel yep. old, but it's it's really kind of like the almost the prime of um, an athlete's life. So it wouldn't it would be mm. it would be possible, you know, theoretically to go and. Um, and the like, and just didn't didn't appeal to you. No, it, it didn't because of other things that I was wanting to probably do in my life. So, um, a thirty year old with with no kids, I'd I'd be there in a heartbeat. Um, thirty year old with a couple of kids and a, and a family and um, things like that. It's just wasn't really appealing to me. Um, and also, I had in the back of my mind, what if it, what if I go? It doesn't sound so the greatest thing to say, but what if I go and do all this again and then don't make it? Mm. Um, it's probably a little bit selfish, but I was pretty, pretty stung from from kind of what went on. Um, and also, I never really saw myself as being that career hockey player. Like mm. um, it's inter- I, I think it's pretty interesting. And if I had played the Olympics, I think that would have been. I probably would have called, pulled the pin straight away. So um, I did prolong it and play for another couple of years. And I'm really happy that I did and proved to myself that I could get back there and, and still kind of mix it, you know, with the, with the top people in the world. Um, but for sure, I, I, I knew that, yeah, that full kind of emotional roller coaster of and really having another, another dip at it, it probably wasn't for me. Um, and I always used to say that by that time, there's going to be, um, heaps better young guys in there that are going to push me out anyway and that's probably where, where it's at now I reckon if I try to go over there now and play um, I'd get chopped up so I'm, I'm pretty happy that that's the case too so you always want you always want um, yeah you always want the shirt to be left in a better place so um, I'm pretty happy with that and when you did leave it you 
I think this is right. You played 102 games, so you notched that um, that century up, which is no mean feat. Yeah, by any circumstance. Um, how did that conversation go with yourself, deciding that uh, I'm happy to have played my last game? Uh, it was pretty easy, to, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I, I knew I knew it was coming for for a while. Um, the probably the harder conversation was I was you know maybe sitting at mid ninety games, and I, I knew. Um, there was a couple of extra little tournaments and little things that I could go and play and maybe get those get those extra games and that was the harder conversation with myself was um, do I want to go and play those do I want to get this get this cap because for me it, um, I don't I don't downplay playing 100 games for my country I'm, that's one of the things I'm super proud of but I was also never someone that that counted those games or or, or anything like that, or, or thought that those milestones were going to make me. So, no one's no one's going to remember me as you know just for being a hundred game player. Um, I'd hope they remember me, especially the guys I played with, for the way I played and, um, and and always wanting to be on on my team, basically. So, that was the harder conversation: was do I want to go and have it, have that dip? And and I'm so I'm really happy that I did. Um, Partly because of what it meant for kind of my family and, and friends around me. So they were always so supportive of me going and, and wanting me to do well. And I think that was kind of a bit of an icing on the cake whereas they saw me pulling away from something that I really enjoyed and I really still wanted to do. Um, and they were always pushing me back into it and saying, hey, we're, we're here for you no matter what happens. Like whether this is it or whether you do want to try and play another another Olympics or um, keep playing and doing whatever we're here for you, no matter what. Um, so going back and playing those extra games, that probably was, was more for them um, for anything. Um, but, but yeah, I do get that nice mantle now. And I say, Hey, I've, I've played a hundred games from, from my country and which is nice when you're, you're down at the pub and people have not much idea about hockey or not much idea about it and don't think that much of it. Um, but when you say you played a hundred games for Australia, um, they're pretty impressed. Mm, mm. I want to um, I want to go on now and talk about just kind of like your approach to sport in general, because um, as you say, trying to be someone who who teammates want to have on their team and not wanting to come up against. Um, oh, yeah. That's a pretty perfect description of of who you are, who you were, who you are still as a player. Um, can you talk to me about how you kind of developed that that mentality? And and second question, what do you think is important to achieving that? Because you did, you know, like you yep. you definitely have a presence on the field and, and guys definitely take heart from the fact that they're not having to be marked by you, you're marking one of their guys, etc. Um, yeah. Um look, I mean, it started out as me just being an aggressive person. Um <laughs> And I, I think the way I developed it was overstepping that line so many times so that I, could, I knew where that line was, okay? And I, and I could, over, over the years, I could develop myself into being that player that can go to that point if I need to. And I would make sure that people that played against me knew that I would and could <laughs> go there um, and would do those types of things. Um, but I developed that balance in knowing that you don't need to do it all the time. Or if you do do those type of things all the time out of control, then you're no good to yourself and you're no good to your team. So um, a, a big part of, I suppose, my approach to sport um, is being really aggressive. Like I don't, I don't care who I'm, who I'm playing against. Um, it can be my best friend. It can be someone I've played with and won tournaments with and shared success with but if they're on the other team for that period um i'm 100 percent against them um and like you've experienced it everyone that i play against has experienced it um and that's kind of how i go about it um just really trying to make sure that any single contest i go into i, I don't ever back down and i don't show that i'm not up for it um that's probably the, the biggest thing that i take onto the field um and then I try and wipe that off the field um, as, much, as much as possible. Sometimes it stays out there, unfortunately. But um, yeah, that's that's pretty much how I how I approach hockey. Is every, every time on the field, I'm gonna do whatever it kind of takes to 
to win, basically. Gotcha. Gotcha. There's a, a good memory I have. I think we're in Malaysia playing Aslan Shah. It would have been hot, really hot. I don't know who we were playing, but I remember, and this isn't the first time, but um, typically quarter time, half time, et cetera, you can always hear your voice ringing out about kind of body posture and that sort of thing. Yep. Um, what do you mean when you're talking about that? Why is that important and, and what is it? Yeah, I think a little bit cliche is you, you don't want to show any any weakness. Um, never show that you're, you're hurt or anything like that. So um, I feel like that's part of an intimidation factor. So intimidation doesn't have to be going out there and physically or verbally attacking someone. Um, I think, you know, your voice and your presence um, and the way you carry yourself can be intimidating to another team. So, yeah, I always used to think that if, if the other team walked out and saw us at quarter time standing tall not hunched over walking out there with a lot of voice um and looking like we're really really ready for the contest and if they're slightly not not there um, or they're having those doubts in their mind which we were too but we weren't showing then i think we we'd have a big edge over them um and that's something that you can build into any level of hockey it doesn't have to be the, the elite level like like you and i were, were playing and you still are but um it, I, I take that out into, into my club hockey. Um, <clears throat> you can take that out into, into any aspect of, of life um, is, is showing that you, you look like you belong. Um, even if sometimes you might be packing it inside, <laughs> you never want to show that because, uh, you know, it's, it's a contest. It's, it's, it's one-on-one basically um, one team versus the other and whoever's going to give a little bit, um, is probably going to lose. Do you look to your opposition um, for any signs as if they're giving it or do you get a rise out of that? I don't think so. No, um, not, not specifically. I'm always wanting to make sure that what my guys are doing or what I'm doing um, is, is, is the right thing. Um, I used to, I think, try and look for, for cues in the other team. Um, but in terms of, you know, when, when I'm out on the field, actually, probably when I'm out on the field, I do... I do look for that, obviously, because if I'm testing them or if I'm trying to be physical, I'm trying to see if they're going to wilt or if they're going to give in a little bit. Um, so that is that is a factor. But, yeah, in, in terms of am I worried about the other team? No, no, no way, really. Um, because I think if you do start really worrying about the other team, um, then you, you might have lost it already. So. Now, if you missed it last week, we had an all-time interview with former Kookaburra, Nathan Eglinton. Here's a peek. Post Olympics, we're in the we're in the um, in our apartment, second or third day after, or something. And it was at the time when okay, we're going to do the signing session. You know, you know the signing session. So you get all your gear out and you put them all around the tables, and people go around and sign all your your shirts and stuff that you want to take away for memorabilia or whatnot. So they were all they were all positioned out around the around the uh, apartment anyways i think i think we'll throw water bombs off the balcony at people and in the i village. don't know whether it was a, yeah yeah and so in the in the olympic village and i don't know if it was a water bomb or an entire plastic bag of water i cannot remember <laughs> but anyway one got hurled down and it happened to be the spanish second goalkeeper or something anyway as soon as it hits he stops and heads for the apartment like coming this is up after this is this is after the, this is, this, this, the is po- this is po- yeah this, so this is post olympics so we've won so we're <laughs> we're in there having a good time enjoying village life whatever yeah. and he starts heading for the apartment <laughs> and all of us are like oh my god what's he doing he's coming up what do we do what do we do what do we do anyway we didn't run we didn't realize that on his way up he's grabbed a fire hydrant off the wall <laughs> and as he's walked in as he's come up He's opened the door and then he's just let this thing go. And I meant emptied it. Like, and we're all going, oh my God. And then as he goes, we're all trying to chase him. As he leaves, he's, li- he's doing it above him. So you can't see him. <laughs> then it empties and then he's off. And everyone goes, yeah, well played, mate. Well played. Bit of a laugh. Anyway, we walk back in. The entire room is filled with this lime yellowish dust all over everyone's memorabilia to be signed. Jeez. Like, I mean, it was covered in it. That's unbelievable. And so, 
So in in our were in our minds, yeah, we had a bit of a laugh, but in his mind, he's sitting in Spain thinking, I had the last laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can hit a ball at us. How's your fire hydrant going? <laughs> That was Nathan Eglinton speaking on our last episode of The Help Side, and it was an absolute ripper. So make sure you go back and have a listen. But for now, let's get back to Tristan. Speaking of, we, we touched on dynasties a little earlier, and you were speaking about any level of sport, trying to bring that in. You're involved with two kind of club sporting dynasties over on the, on the East Coast, obviously with Moorbank Liverpool in Sydney. Very successful club team um, has won. I mean, they've always been winning, really, but more specifically in the last decade or so um, with you there and also Uni of Wollongong who are also a very successful club team. What are the sort of things do you think it takes to um, to develop that team? Because you've obviously been a leader in, in many of those teams but also perhaps been one of the younger guys witnessing and I guess mm. being a passenger in, in great teams as well. Uh, yeah, it's, that's a good... That's a really good question and something that's hard to, to pinpoint. Um, I, I suppose the success from, from both of the teams that I'm involved in, um, so University of Wollongong, which is my local team, and Moorbank Liverpool in Sydney, um, they've both probably, probably kind of drawn some inspiration from um, the past players that were involved in, in Moorbank. So... Look, when I when I first started playing with Moorbank, I had some amazing players around me, um, some some that are still there and some amazing coaches. So Robert Green is hands down the best club hockey player that I think there ever has been. Um, I'm willing to kind of fight anyone about that as well. <laughs> um, he's, he, he's won 11, 11 premierships um, and been a mentor and a big part of um, the development of those, those club guys. Um, and so... I latched onto him when I got to Moorbank and I learned a lot from him. Um, Nathan Gilbert, who's the current coach, um, but when I started was, was the, the captain coach. Um, and he's like, he's the director around there. Um, he's, he's a strange dude at times, but he knows his hockey and he knows um, what it takes to, to kind of get a team working and get a team firing. Um, and then... The other part of it, I suppose, is just having a really good camaraderie and mateship with, with those players. So naturally, you spend enough time with them um, that they become your really close mates um, and you, you feel really comfortable with them. And also, you don't want to let them down. So, you know, we've, we've got guys that are, that are traveling up and making all these sacrifices, not seeing their family, been doing it for 10 years, 15 years with the same club. Um, and are still doing it because they don't want to let their teams down and they, and they enjoy it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the things I learned in those early years, um, Moorbank was always going to be successful. But what I was able to take from Moorbank to Wollongong um, was invaluable. So we, had a, we obviously had a group of guys there. So myself, Flynn Ogilvie, um, who's in the Australian team, obviously, um, and his his kind of brothers are all in those those kind of same teams, um, and we took whatever we learned. We took that professionalism from from Warbank because they do treat it up there as a as a professional team. You know, they're not there to make numbers. We we want to win every single game, and and we want to earn um, everything that we deserve up there. So we took that down to to the club hockey down here, um, and made sure that every time we approached a game. Um, we we approached it with a bit of professionalism and we took, instead of just playing, you know, club hockey where you go out there and do whatever and, and you know, you, if you've got the better guys, you might win. We tried to take that, that out of the equation and make sure that we were building up the players around us and that we're playing a proper style of hockey because um, it's one thing to be good and skillful, but if you understand the, the game plan um, and understand the concepts of what's going on, um, you can make average players into good players and, and average teams into, into great teams. Yeah, and I'm super lucky to what's gone on um, and how successful we've been in Wollongong and how successful we've been in in, uh, in Moorbank. And look, the other thing with Moorbank is they've always been successful. So no matter what we, have, this recent group, has been able to do, we feel like we're still playing catch-up. So mm. um, we feel like we always still got a point to prove, um, which I think is really healthy um, for our group. 
For sure. And within that Moorbank team and as well with uh, the New South Wales Pride this year, you were, you were the captain. Um, is there anything about leadership or the approach to captaining the team? Because it sounds a lot like you're about building up those around you and, and kind of using uh, your teammates to get the most out of the team as a whole. What's your approach to, to yep. captaincy and leadership? Um, I, I feel like I don't want to make myself the, the focal point. Um, and I, I'm lucky that a, I'm not that superstar style of player. So people don't just look and go, he's going to take care of everything. Um, I really draw on every, everyone else around me. Um, and especially with, with a team like, with a team like Moorbank, um, there's so many good guys and so many other experienced guys. We've got a really good mix. So the way I see myself in that team is I'm kind of the link between the older guys who are still there and have all this experience and all this knowledge um, and the younger guys who are coming through and are those fresh superstars. And on that link is to getting them all to work together and, and be cohesive um, and hopefully passing down my role onto someone else that's going to be that link for the next generation so that, you know, Moorbank doesn't have, you know, massive drops off the cliff um, that we're always successful. Um, and then that approach to, to, I suppose, leading was pretty amplified in the, in the New South Wales Pride team um, last year. So, yeah, to be honest, when I looked on paper out there, I went, geez, do I need to be here? Um, this team is just full of, full of all these amazing young guys. Um, and I really think the only big thing I could have added to that team and I suppose did add to that team was a bit of leadership. So you could have plugged another player in there to play my role, no doubt. Um, but I thought all I'm going to do out here is make sure these young guys know that I've got their back um, and know that I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of, of what they're doing and however they want to approach the game, um, I'm kind of there to, to make sure we all pull together in that way. So we obviously had some really vocal um, players. You know, you're one of them, mate, <laughs> um, that, that has that has some really strong ideas about hockey um, and it's obviously going to clash at times. So I felt like my role there um, and also, sorry, also we, we had a really strong coach in, in Brent Livermore, who is one of the greatest players to ever play. Um, and he has some, some really strong ideas about how he wanted to play um, and they're amazing. And I think all I wanted to do was make sure that everyone pulled together because there's naturally going to be times where, um, you don't agree with what the coach is saying or you don't agree with what another player is saying. Um, I felt my role there was I, I could kind of sit back, sit back from it all and, and really understand why people um, were saying certain things um, and why, you know, why we wanted to pull in a certain way when some guys couldn't understand that. So I felt like that was all I was doing was just pulling everyone on the same page. Sure. We're going to shift tack a little bit here. Um, mm -hmm. You've, you've worked in business now or as a mortgage broker for, for some time and um, mm -hmm. a lot's made of the, the combination between sport and business and how they kind of feed into each other. What's your experience with that? Um, yeah, there's, there is a massive link. Um, I think if you're a good teammate, um, and you're out there willing to do the things we've spoken about. So you're willing to do whatever it takes for your team on the sporting field, then naturally that's going to flow into, into what you do um, in business. So, um, and the other kind of philosophies of, of making sure you're never kind of letting anyone down. I think that's a sum that I take in the business. I mean, I'm in a pretty, um, I'd say stressful industry not not for myself as a mortgage broker because i understand everything that's going on but i'm dealing with people who are making the biggest financial decision of their lives um you know buying houses buying their first home buying investment properties spending massive amounts of money um and not really having a big idea of the process so i'm dealing with these kind of um highly strung um, and, and probably pretty scared people at times um so yeah i, I feel like making sure that i'm, I'm there for them um, and really being being someone they want to have on their team and being someone that they trust. And again, going back to, they know that, um, yeah, Tristan, the mortgage broker, um, he's on my side here. He's pulling with me. Um, I'm 
you know, if it makes them feel more comfortable, then that's that's probably a big important part of how I see I see business. Yeah. And is it is it mortgage broking for life now? Is it, or is there something else around the corner? No, I think it's mortgage broking for well, for for a while. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really lucky. I'm in a, a really kind of um, small, strong business that's growing really rapidly. Um, and I've got a great client base around here and we're in kind of a good demographic and a good area for business. So um, all things are going well right now. Um, and I, I definitely see that continuing continuing for a while. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, we're going to wrap up there. But before we do, we've got a couple of quick questions to, to rattle off before we let you go to go and be a dad. Again, thanks for being generous with your time. Um, right. Best player you've ever played with? Uh, it's Mark Knowles. Um, he just conducts everything on the field. So, yeah, hands hands down, he I, I, you don't feel more comfortable with anyone else on your team um, than than Nolsey. So, yeah, has to be him. Do you think he has a little bit of what you try and bring to to teams? Yeah, pretty much. Well, I he's got that and then some. So he's the, he's the master of it. And what I tried to do was kind of be a bit like Nolsey. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of what I, what I, what I want to do for, for my teams is be that guy. And he, to be honest, he, he sees things two steps ahead of everyone else. Um, and that's cause he's, he's nice and relaxed and really confident in what's going to happen. And yeah, I think that's what I try to do now. Um, definitely works at a club level, which is obviously a step down, but um, yeah, I, I can't say enough about, about Mark Nolsey. He's the, the hands down best player I've played with. Sure. Uh, best you've ever played against. And I'll add another caveat here. Is there anyone who you've played against who brings what, or you, you really didn't want to play against someone who's got equal measure intimidation? <laughs> um, oh, well, firstly, best player I've ever played against, um, which is a bit of a strange one because I played with him for quite a while as well, but uh, Jamie Dwyer. So, I think the first year or two I was in Perth training with the Australian team. I don't reckon I tackled him once. <laughs> he is the master of the one-on-one contest and setting up um, and setting up players. Um, so yeah, he was definitely the hardest player I've ever played against. Um, and I was lucky that I got to play with him. Um, excuse the crying. In the <laughs> I was lucky that I <laughs> the kids are home. I was lucky that I got to play with him more than I got to play against him um, because he's yeah he's just the master of of setting you up and um, turning you into a fiddle. I think. And the the second bit was um, um... no not not really. Um, I mean you love that stuff anyway. Been... Just eat that up. You want that? Yeah, there's yeah there's definitely been some people I've had those big contests with um never really in an international setting to be honest um just because that's not their their style um but there's definitely there's definitely you know in some in some club settings or in some kind of um australian settings where i've played against people and gone out there and we've just had it at each other um never wouldn't say i was intimidated by them though so <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't say I, was, I wouldn't say i was worried but they certainly they certainly kind of stepped up to the plate and um, and with all those guys, there's massive respect um, and always kind of um, make a point to, to speak with them afterwards or shake hands afterwards and leave it on the game, um, on the field. Yeah, okay. Um, proudest moment? Yeah, I mean, as we've touched on it and that was um, being selected for, for Rio. Um, obviously, it didn't work out uh, well as the fairy tale, but that was the proudest moment for me because I had achieved something that I said I was going to do as a kid. Um, and to see how happy it made kind of my mom, um, my wife, Lauren, and all my friends and family around me, that was definitely the proudest moment. Like there was just everyone and everyone was reaching out and just saying how, how happy they were and how they always knew it was going to happen. Or some were saying, I told you, you idiot, you should have been trying harder at this years ago. Um, that was definitely the proudest moment on a hockey in a hockey sense, um, and yeah, even though it didn't work out well, I still when I look back at hockey, yeah, that's the best hockey moment for me. Um, yeah, outside of hockey, yeah, it's pretty easy. When I was, became a dad, so um, kind of when you become a dad, you shift from being 
um, someone that uh, is, you know, maybe people think's a bit reckless or a bit loose to, oh, this guy's, this guy must be, this, you know, well, well put together and, um, <laughs> you know, nice, nice guy. Um, and they're obviously really proud of, of, of that, of, of you when you do that. So that was my other moment. Yeah. Gotcha. Last question. Um, let's pretend that you're about to, you, you're giving a pep talk to someone who's about to make their debut at any level of competition. It doesn't matter. What's one piece of advice yeah. you would say to them to prepare them for what's to come? Uh, I'd probably say you need to stay relaxed throughout the process um, and know that you're, you're not always going to feel relaxed, but if you can keep reminding yourself to be relaxed or to try to calm down, you'll make better decisions and, and be a, a better a better hockey player. So um, that's something that everyone battles with. It's something that I'm always battling with is try and be relaxed, try and be relaxed, try and be relaxed, even when I've stepped over the line. Um, but yeah, that's that's the main thing for, for people going out there into, into a big contest. Brilliant advice. We'll leave it there. Thanks again, mate. I appreciate it. Now uh, go look after you, your kids. Sound like they need your help. No worries. <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. I appreciate it. That's it for another episode of The Help Side. Special thanks to my production team of David Moore and Tim Collier, plus countless others working behind the scenes to get this to you. You're the real MVPs. Again, if you're liking the show, please like, subscribe, you know the drill, and get in touch with us via our socials. We would love to hear from you. Anyway, that's all, folks. See you next week.